Let's get into the Word of God as we start a new series entitled Prodigal. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 15. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 15. When you have it, say amen. The Word of God says, starting in verse 1, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. Speaking of Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until, until he finds it? Let us pray. Father, thank you so much. As we begin this new series, Father, we cannot wait to see what you have in store for us. Open up our hearts and our minds that we may be able to hear and to see and know what you have in store for us. We trust you. Be present and pour out your spirit upon us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. Wow. So Jesus is hanging around sinners, tax collectors, the outcast of this society. And the Pharisees have issue with it. And I need you to understand why they have issue with it. There were many Pharisees that actually were enthralled with Jesus' teachings. They were moved by his words. There were many Pharisees and teachers of the law that were inspired by his miracles. But one thing really compromised Jesus' ministry to the point where many of the Pharisees said, we can't go here with you. And that was his involvement with people who were outside the church. They just couldn't go there. It devalued Jesus' teachings in their eyes. It, 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 it brought him down to a lowly place. And, and now Christ did not look as academic. Christ did not appear as messianic. Christ no longer seemed to be the, the rabbi everyone was clamoring to hear. Rabbi, why would you do this? Teacher, why would you do this? Because the thinking is, is if you have a good word and God has called you, be around like-minded people. Be around people of a certain uh, ilk and class. Be around those who will elevate your status. But do not compromise your character or compromise your influence by being around some of these ruffians. So why would you do this? And Jesus' words are really powerful. In fact, they could relate to them because this is what shepherds would do. He said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now, I'm just going to be honest right now. If I lost one out of a hundred sheep, I really wouldn't care that much. I'm going to keep it real. I, I feel like I'd be like, that's his fault. <laughs> he should have been following a little bit closer. Right? Right? I had an experience when I was in Utrecht, uh, in Holland, and I was there for the general conference session back in 1999, I think it was, or 90, yeah, 99, it was in 99. And I was, I was out there, and uh, actually it was 95, my, my apologies, 1995, I was out there. And so I was out there for about three weeks, and I was scheduled to speak for one of the youth events there in Holland. And while I was out there, I was working with the filming crew, and we were doing some, you know, new young adult video magazine, and I was one of the correspondents. So during my free time, uh, me and the crew went for a bicycle ride out in the country of Volendam. Now, if any of you have spent any time out there and avoided Amsterdam and you spent time in the holy Volendam countryside, um, you will know that there's lots of sheep. And I grew up in the Inland Empire. I grew up in the IE. I grew up around Loma Linda. There ain't no sheep. The, the closest I had ever come to any sheep was like storybooks, children books. And so as we're riding our bicycles along the way, I see this pasture full of sheep. And I tell my friends, stop, stop, I want to see them. 
So we, we pull over, we set down our bikes, and we start to walk over, but there was a channel of water, it was about six feet wide, that did not permit us to get any closer. Well, it did not permit them to get any closer. But me, I'm a basketball star, I have ups, I just need a head start, and I can clear this channel of water. And so sure enough, I did. I made it all the way to the other side. Unfortunately, it was very soft landing there, very muddy, and my legs went all the way in, ruined my shoes. But you know what? It didn't matter. I'm about to get a close-up interview with some sheep. So I tell my friend to toss me the video camera, and he does, and I start calling out to the sheep. Now, I don't know how you call out to sheep. I just did it like they were kitty cats. Children, I was just going... Right? And the sheep started backing up. They literally were just like. They started to move away from me. They moved away from me. But there was one sheep that decided to stop and confront me. All of them left except for this one sheep. And he responded to my cat calls. Come here. Come here. Good you little cutie. Did you move? Here's the problem. Sheep aren't that cute when you get close to them. <laughs> Have you ever seen sheep's eyes? They're like demon eyes. They're not cute. So as the sheep started to get closer to me, I was like, ooh, I started to get a little spooked. I was like, oh, boy, I'm going to turn the camera off here. Lord, I don't know what you were thinking. What is going on? And so I got scared as it got closer to me, and I just froze, thinking that it would not find me if I didn't move. It doesn't sense movement, I guess. I don't know. I just froze. And that sheep came all the way up to me. Children, he came up to me. I was so scared. Those eyes. This is exactly what Revelation was talking about. Oh. And that little sheep came up to me and he started sniffing. And then he got to the lens of the camera and he started sniffing. And guess what, kids? He then licked it. <laughs> as soon as the sheep did that, I hear the shepherd saying, get out of here. What are you doing here? I'm, so, I'm sorry, sir. I just wanted to get out of here. I'm trying to explain myself. But you don't understand. I've never seen sheep before. Get out. And so I was ready to run and jump back the way I came in. He goes, no, no, this way. And he took me through the sheep gate. You see, I couldn't come through the sheep gate because I was not the shepherd. But he had me exit through the sheep gate the right way to come in, the right way to leave. But I remember this experience, and it was quite moving to me. And I said, oh, there's so many applications here. The problem with this text, Jesus talking about leaving the, the, the 99 that have remained and going after that lost one, it's a key word there. It says, he left them in the open country. What I wanted to tell the shepherd, it's not my fault, it's your fault. Six feet wide, anybody could jump that. You should, have been a, you should have done a better job protecting them. An electric fence would have worked. But Jesus says, the shepherd leaves the 99 in the open country. Very key word, open country, very vulnerable. And for those of you who would say, but the shepherd leaves them with a hireling. Remember Jesus said that a hireling will not lose their life over those sheep. A hireling, if a wolf or a bear or a lion comes, will, will leave, will run. So this is what happens. I want you to understand this. Christ is saying that a shepherd will leave the 99 faithful out in the open, vulnerable, to go after that one lost sheep that was intrigued by somebody holding a camera. Let me ask you this question. How responsible is this as a shepherd? Think about it from a financial standpoint. Would you really risk 10 more, 11 more, 15 more of your, your sheep being harmed by a, a, a thief or a, 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 an animal, a predator, just for one? It doesn't appear very responsible, but Jesus obviously has an audience that can connect with that. Many of us, if we look back in our life of the things that we lost, 
they weren't very necessary for us to hold on to them. That purse, those shoes, right? That, that particular toy. It's not like if we didn't find the toy, our life would lose this, you know, its quality. The reality is that one extra sheep is almost like a luxury. Hey, this is part of the job. If you lose it, move on. Big picture. God wanted to save this world. From what we understand in scripture and what we understand from inspired uh, authorship in our, in our church, we are the only ones that fell. Out of all of God's universe, we are the only ones that failed. And yet the Bible tells us in John 3, 16 that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus was on a mission to rescue us, to save us. We were that one lost sheep. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Jesus' rescue mission left the entire universe vulnerable. If Jesus fails in his mission to save us, he doesn't just lose us, he loses the entire universe. Is it worth the risk? Are you worth the risk? Jesus uses an illustration that his audience can understand, but deeper than that, he uses an illustration that is founded in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 34, I want you to go there with me. In Ezekiel chapter 34, God is dealing with the shepherds of Israel. And he has a lament against them. He's, he's upset that they have decided to, to focus on themselves instead of the sheep. God is, God is perturbed that they have neglected their responsibility for the lost sheep of Israel. Instead, they wanted to fatten their wallets. Instead, they wanted to, to, uh, uh, to have more food at their table and allow the sheep to starve. And so God comes hard at them. Listen just to a little bit of these words in verse 2. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord says in chapter 34, verse 2. This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not the shepherds take care of the flock? So God, again, he goes hard at them. And you have the time, to, you know, please read it uh, after the worship experience here. So he's very upset with them, but then God says something that you cannot miss. Verse 11, and we'll have this on the screen, verse 11. You have your Bibles, you can still follow. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will what? Rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Skip down to verse 14. I will tend to them. I will, t I will tend them in a good pasture. And the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land. And, and they will feed in a rich pasture on mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong, I'll destroy. Verse 22, I will shepherd the flock with justice. I will save my flock and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. By this time, David, who we did a series on, has already passed away. So when he's referencing my servant David, anyone who is reading this knows he's speaking of the Messiah. The one who would come down the Davidic line. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Who is going to be our good shepherd? Jesus. Jesus would be the good shepherd. Jesus would be the one that would seek and save the lost. Jesus would, 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 would climb any mountain, go down to any ravine. Jesus would go into the dark valleys to find us. 
in that chapter, it says that he would bring his people out of all the nations. But the ones who have been fattening themselves on the, on the, on the food of, from the land, those, he says, nah, I'm cutting them off. But all these lost folk, all these lost sheep, now you need to understand something about sheep. They're not the smartest animals. Cats don't need a cat herder. Sheep actually need a shepherd to guide them to the place where they can eat, to steal waters. If the waters aren't still, a, fi- uh, a sheep can actually drown. Crazy, I know. They're not smart. That's why when, when God <laughs> refers to us as sheep, I'm a little offended. But I get it. But this is, what, this is what God says he's going to do. I'm going to send my servant David. I'm going to send my only son. I'm going to send him to find you. Now, the first lesson I want you to understand in, in all of this, and this is probably going to land a certain way, but I need you to get this. No one in God's green earth, no one remains lost. No one remains lost. And how do we know no one remains lost? Because Jesus is searching for them. And Jesus will find every single lost sheep. Now, some will say, but pastor, you can't say that no one remains forever lost because because we know that in the end, there are those who are lost and will not inherit the kingdom of God. But they're not lost. They're found. They just choose not to go in. That's a difference. Satan and one-third of heaven were not lost. They just made a choice. But when you are lost, God will find you. That's why some of you who are grandparents and parents and you're concerned about your children and you've told me, Pastor, I'm so concerned about them, I just want them to be saved. I never stress out about that because I know who the good shepherd is. And I know he's searching for them. And I know that he has better strategies than me. And I know the Holy Spirit understands their hearts and their minds better than me. He knows their experiences better than I know them. And so I trust the good shepherd. Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. I am the sheep gate. They enter through me into eternal life. My sheep know my voice. Jesus will find every single lost person. And I know this because he's the good shepherd. Now, of course, you're going to say, but pastor, you have, not, uh, 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 you have not fixed the tension that you created by saying that God left the rest of the 99 vulnerable. You made it sound like it was irresponsible. Well, the word prodigal, the word prodigal, which we now see as synonymous with being lost or uh, somebody who has been lost but now found, actually the original word means something a little bit different. Wasteful, reckless, extravagant. Do you believe that God is wasteful? Anybody? Anybody? Well, we know that Jesus died for everyone's sin, but everyone he died for, will they go to heaven? I would say that's wasteful. Could have been more particular. Christ could have actually, if he wanted to, said, you know, Father, I only want to pay for the sins of those who will love me. The ones who will repent, the ones who will choose forgiveness, the ones who will follow in my path. I don't want to suffer for those who will hate me, no matter what I do. But God is extravagant. God is the prodigal. What may look on the outside is extravagant. What may look on the outside is reckless, leaving 99 for just one. God has a plan, believe it or not, that will secure everyone, including the 99. God's actions, believe it or not, God's actions by coming to this earth was actually securing the entire universe. 
The universe was unstable once Satan began to put out his claims that God could not be trusted. God was too weak. God was insufferable. God was not, God, God was not as, as, uh, as kind and as compassionate as he was purporting himself to be. God's entire universe was potentially unstable after all the claims of Lucifer. That's why it was so important for Jesus to show up and show the entire universe who the good shepherd is. The problem is, is that God does look less powerful. God does look less powerful by hanging out with the lost. God does look less powerful by becoming a man. God does look less powerful by allowing himself to die. Yes, but the security of the universe isn't based on power. It's based on character. We're not trying to figure out who's strongest. If that was the case, God would show up as a 60-foot giant and would have said, boo. And we all would have been like, all right, we lift your name on high. The great controversy between, man, between God and Satan is not based on who is the strongest. It's not a power struggle. It's a character struggle. Who do you trust? And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I will place myself in a vulnerable situation to find every lost soul. What we need to understand as we look at Scripture, love can appear weak. Love can appear weak. There are those who are loving that some will say, you're just a doormat. People are walking all over you. Even in this church, I've had people say, oh, pastor, you watch out for that person. You got you to stand tall. You got to put your foot down. You can't let. And I get it. Appear strong. Be strong. Don't let anybody get away with anything. Love can make you look weak, but love is the strongest agent in the universe. God is love. And if you are paying attention to Ezekiel 34, you will realize that God takes responsibility even for us being lost. I will do it. We kept reading that. I will do that. I will come down. I will search. I will retrieve. I will take them to a land where they have good pastures. I will tend to them. I will lead them to the waters. I am the good shepherd. Not once does he say, you are good sheep. <laughs> you deserve this pasture. I am the good shepherd. And that is why you'll be able to feast. And that is why you will be found. I want to let you know something right now. I want to encourage you. Because God is so extravagant, because God on the outside may appear to be reckless, because of that, God will not lose anyone. He will not lose anyone. Anyone who chooses not to be with him is making a choice. It's not God losing them. No one will be lost at the end of time. It's just people who have made choices. Some to choose to trust the good shepherd and some choose not to. Let's land the plane here. These sheep are in a situation that they're in in Ezekiel 34 because the shepherds have ignored them. Let me tell you something. Your children who you have seen as being lost, some of you who have spent some time being lost, it's not all your fault. We're a part of a broken system. We are. Some of your children who do not like religion and never want to step foot in the church, if you could really hear their heart out, you would know exactly why they don't want to. And they have just reasons not to show up at church. Some of us who we have shared the picture of God, it has been toxic. God hasn't been a good shepherd. God has been a tyrant. God has been a dictator. Some of you will say, but pastor, God must judge. He must be just. But even God's justice is nothing like our justice. There's a system that we're a part of. And it's not all of our fault. And God understands that. That is why he seeks and he saves the lost. He's not in tax collectors' faces saying, you should be doing better. I can't believe you. 
God understands why tax collectors and outcasts and adulterers land where they land. He understands why you keep a safe distance from the church. He understands why you are hesitant, why you are skeptical, skeptical why you are agnostic. He understands it. It's a broken, sin-riddled system. And God understands it. That's why he comes. He's the good shepherd. And he loses his life to break that system, to break that curse. He wants to rescue us from that system. Some of you say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. Yeah, the God that you have been raised to believe, I don't believe in that God either. I believe in a God who is love. I believe in the God of the gospel. I believe in God as he is experienced and seen through the person of Jesus Christ. Anything that does not align with Jesus Christ is not God. It's a fable. It's Disney. It's make-believe. And so Christ ends this parable in this way. And of course, you saw the verse up there in John 10, John 10, uh, uh, verses 10 and 11, that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it what? Full, abundance. He's the good shepherd. He's come to make life better, not more burdensome. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. It matters that much to Jesus that he would lose his life in order for us to gain life. We close on this. Luke chapter 15 verse 7 says this. I tell you that in the same way, as he's closing out this part of the parable, I tell you in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not need to repent. Now, I don't know about you, I might think that it might make more sense to be excited, more excited about the 99 that are here. But God says, I place more value, listen to this, more value on the one who comes back, the one who repents over those who have remained. This is going to be shocking to you. It's going to make you feel uncomfortable, and it might make you second guess why you asked me to hang out with you. But God, based on his actions, cares more about those who are lost than those who are already saved. No, no, you got to hear this spiritually. I'm not saying he loves them more than he loves you. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying by his actions, there is more care, more thoughtfulness, more attention given to those who are lost than those who are in the house. Which means that as we do ministry here in this church, what should matter most, preferentially speaking, is not how you think and how you feel, but those who are not here, how they think and how they feel. We have discussions about what kind of music we should have in this church because our needs should be taken account of. We understand this. God is saying it matters more how they think, why they have left, why they don't want to return than you. You're good. I trust you. You're mature enough. They're not. Let's bring them home. Strategically speaking, their needs should come before ours. Their wants should come before ours. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? <sighs> Makes me. But this is what the prodigal God does. He's extravagant. For some, it'll look like he's wasteful. He'll do whatever it takes. Even if it means he leaves the 99 to go focus on that lost, that one lost one. And heaven will rejoice more. Family, I want heaven to rejoice. There's someone that you know. I've talked to somebody this week over at the academy, a parent and a member at this church. <clears throat> he was talking about his family. Talking about his father. Talking about his brother. And that's all I've been able to think about. 
We want them here. What will it take? I want you to think about someone right now. What will it take? That spouse, that child, what will it take? Have you asked them? What do you need in order to feel comfortable? What do you need? How can we help? Jesus is going to find them. We better get on board. Father, thank you so much for the challenge you've given us this morning to remind us of the prodigal nature of your gifts, the prodigal nature of your character. You are extravagant. You will seek. You will find. This is not up for debate. It's you. You're the good shepherd. You're an expert at this. We just want to make sure that we are. We want to make sure we are on the same page with you. So, Father, continue to teach us as we go through this series to learn your heart. What does it take to be the kind of shepherd, the kind of member, the kind of pastor, the kind of minister, the disciple that would leave the 99 to go after that one? So we're willing to hear your strategy, God. We're opening our hearts up to you right now. We want to be inspired by you. We want to be good shepherds. In Jesus' name.